back, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. But if you thought lunch was a treat, well, the real treat is yet to happen. Our next speaker needs no introduction. He is the co-founder of Infosys and its current chairman. He is also the chairman of the Unique Identification Authority of India for nearly five years and is credited with building Aadhaar. He is a member of the Board of Governors of the Indian Council for Research on International Economic Relations and the president of NCAER. He also sits on several advisory boards, including those of the World Economic Forum Foundation. Yes, I am talking about Mr. Nandan Nilekani. Please put your hands together to welcome sir on stage. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Great. Can you hear me now? All right. Yeah. Well, it's it's really great to be here at the future event, this flagship event in uh, Cochin. And uh, I thought I'll give you a brief overview of all the various exciting tech developments that have happened in India over the last decade and why it's relevant to everything that you do in business, in commerce, in entertainment, and so on. I think India now has, uh, as a country, has among the most advanced digital infrastructure. And I'll talk about three or four parts of that infrastructure. One is related to Aadhaar, which is the unique ID for 1.2 billion people. One is related to the India stack, which is a set of layers of capability built on top of identity. Then I'll talk about the advanced payment system that NPCI has launched called the Unified Payment Interface. And then I'll finally talk about the GST system and why technology in India's indirect taxes has enormous implications and consequences for the economy. So Aadhaar, as you know, was an ID system uh, built by the Indian government. I was the first chair of the organization that built it. Uh, today it has uh, 1.2 billion people who use Aadhaar. It's also linked to the financial system, so everyone who has an Aadhaar number can also attach it to a bank account. And India has about 850 million bank accounts linked to Aadhaar of which about 550 million are unique bank accounts. That means 550 million unique people have linked an Aadhaar-linked bank account. And this Aadhaar-linked bank account is the fundamental basis for direct benefit transfer. India runs the world's largest direct benefit transfer system, and so far, since inception, it's transferred 100,000 crores into people's bank accounts using this platform. It's a straight-through processing 24 to 36 hour credit system and it's done about two billion transactions, totaling up to about 100,000 crores. So this is really a huge cash transfer system, and it has big implications for the economy, because instead of money going through multiple layers and, and a leakage of money and so on, money now goes directly electronically into people's bank accounts. The largest program using this is the LPG program, 140 million people every time buy a cylinder with a subsidy, the subsidy goes into the bank account. So one big element of this has been direct transfer, and that is actually the reason why the government has promoted this project, because by ensuring that you use unique identity, that by ensuring that you don't have frauds and duplicates in your beneficiary list, you have massive savings. And so far, the cumulative savings of the government is in the order of about 56,000 crores. Now, what's important is that we are just at the beginning of the journey of direct benefit transfer, because it began with subsidies for LPG, then it went on to pensions, scholarships, other entitlements, and increasingly over the coming years, they will be used for state programs. For example, there's a proposal that for electricity, instead of subsidizing the power price of electricity, you provide electricity at market price and subsidize it through a cash transfer. And that will have big implications for state electricity boards because now the, the unbundling the financial dimension from the, the business of electricity which they are in. So there are a lot of implications to the economy because as you take products out of a subsidized regime and make them at market price and separately fund those who deserve to get a subsidy, 
you're actually making more and more parts of the economy competitive. So there's a big implication of this direct benefit transfer, apart from, of course, the savings from eliminating fraud and corruption. But this is part of a larger thing which is happening. And the big three things that are happening, one is, of course, the fact that everybody has a unique identity. The second big thing which is happening is, of course, a longer evolution, which has been that of mobile phones. And you have seen the dramatic history of mobile phones in this country with big operators like Airtel, Idea, Vodafone. And then, of course, in the last six, eight months, you have seen the impact of Geo, which has made India the largest consumer of data in the world. And consumption of data has shot up six to 10 times, thanks to all the new 4G networks that are coming. So today you have a world where India has about 350 million smartphones, growing at about 100 million smartphones a year, and a total of about a billion phones, of which these 350 million are smartphones. So that means phones and smartphones are becoming ubiquitous, and data is becoming cheaper and cheaper, uh, thanks to all these revolutions. The third big push which has been happening is the expansion of financial inclusion. Just in the last four years, 300 million new bank accounts have been opened, and everybody is getting a bank account. And in some sense, there's a correlation between the bank account and Aadhaar, because you can use an electronic KYC and open an instant bank account. So there's a massive process improvement which has happened, because instead of taking a week and providing all kinds of paperwork to open a bank account, you can open a bank account electronically in two minutes. And many of the banks, including Federal Bank in Cochin, are, are using this technology to expand their customers. So the number of bank accounts have gone up by 300 million in the last four years. So fundamentally, the way to think about this is that we are approaching an era where everybody has an ID number which is digital and verifiable online with biometrics or an OTP. Everybody has a device to communicate with, definitely a feature phone and perhaps a smartphone, and then everybody will have some kind of a bank account to operate on. And this is fundamental infrastructure, digital infrastructure. So you can think of you know, mobile, bank account, and Aadhaar as the, you know, the three pillars of a digital world. And every Indian will have the, already some of, I mean, Aadhaar is all, almost there. But ev everyone will have all these three things. And it's important to realize the significance of this is that for the first time, you have population scale infrastructure. In other words, it's not infrastructure for one city or for one region or one pilot project. The entire population has this infrastructure. And that really means that if you can bring in innovations and products and services using this infrastructure, you can roll it out en masse at scale very rapidly to a billion people. So this means that it has the potential to create productivity in the economy at a far rapider pace than ever before because then you can actually implement something which cuts across everybody. A good example of that is digital signatures. One of the things built on top of, no, before signature, let me just explain, that the identity that we have, the Aadhaar number, which is a 12-digit random number, is a digital ID, which is verifiable either biometrically or with a one-time password to the mobile phone to which your number is connected. And this is called as authentication, online authentication. And online authentication can be done anywhere in the country, on the cloud, where you have a device which can do such an authentication. And you'll be surprised to hear that India is now doing about 1.5 to 1.8 billion authentications a month. So this is now industrial scale use of Aadhaar for authentication. And authentication is very important because in a digital world, proving who you are is the essence of participation, right? Otherwise, you have all this fraud and fake news and bots and all that. So real identity is a big issue on, on the internet and on digital areas. And this ID allows you to do real ID verification on the cloud anywhere. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples of how, or three examples of how this actually benefits people. One example is how it can be used to deliver banking services. Because you want the ability for someone in a village to be able to withdraw money, cash from his bank account. And thanks to DBT, which is 100,000 crores, and thanks to remittances, because in a migrant economy, there's a massive remittance happening, 
either from abroad to India, like what happens here, but also from urban India to rural India. And the urban to rural India tran transfers are about 90,000 crores or about $15 billion a month. So it's really a massive amount of money flowing. So when it hits somebody's bank account in a village, how do they withdraw that cash? And that's a big challenge. And you can't expect a bank branches to be in every village. You can't expect an ATM in every village. So there's now a device called as a micro ATM where you do an Aadhaar authentication biometrically and then you can withdraw money from your bank account from the neighborhood grocery store. So this is a good example of how authentication of identities in a village is a, gives you the ability for someone to withdraw money from their bank account. A second example of what uh, online authentication does is it allows you to create mobility and choice for services. For example, uh, I, I don't know whether it's in Kerala, but certainly in Andhra Pradesh, all the PDS, public distribution ration shops, are on the cloud. They're all on the grid. And if you are a recipient of uh, public distribution system uh, entitlements in Andhra Pradesh, you can go to any one of these shops to withdraw your rice or wheat or sugar or whatever is your entitlement. Now, it, this has two benefits. First, it makes your entitlements portable. So you can go, for example, in many situations, you have a family where the family lives in the village, the, 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 the spouse or the male is in, in, in the Guntur or Vijaywada, and he can withdraw his part of his rations in Vijaywada, his family can withdraw the other part in the village, all using the same authentication infrastructure. So you, you get this kind of mobility. But also equally importantly, when you create mobility of services, then it creates choice, because I can choose to go to any provider of this service. So historically in India, public services provided by government to individuals, there was no choice. I had to go to that panchayat guy, I had to go to that PDS. And if that panchayat guy or PDS plays difficult, then you are stuck with that. And therefore, the bargaining power is with the supplier. But the moment you put the authentication and choice on a cloud, which allows you to go to any service provider, then if particular provider of service, be it a BC for money or a PDS shop for rice, if they decide to be difficult, you can always go to some other supplier. And therefore, when you essentially unlock portability of entitlements using technology, you also transfer bargaining power from the supplier to the buyer, to the consumer. And therefore, you'll see that automatically the, the behavior of suppliers change because they have to be better. They're, they're now competing for customers, and therefore, that improves the, product, uh, the convenience, their behavior. So this is all possible thanks to authentication. A third very good example of authentication is, for example, uh, in a program India has called Jeevan Praman, which is the challenge of how do we deliver pensions for people after they retire. As you know, India spends about 80 to 100,000 crores a year on government pensions, and this is central government, not even state governments. Central government, railways, defense, all this. And they, electronic, they, I mean, they send money to people, but every, because they're worried about people claiming their uh, pensions beyond death, they have something called a life certificate. You have to go and prove you're alive. So every year you have to go and show that you're alive. And historically it meant you had to go to some location and show your face and say, oh, I'm alive, and then somebody would certify it. You wait for a long time, and if you, in some way you're not able to travel, then it was very cumbersome. Now you can use a mobile device with a biometric authentication, and the person can come to your house and do the authentication, and that is proof of being alive. So you suddenly converted authentication into a service which you can deliver at a person's house, especially if they are not, not able to travel, they're bedridden or something. So, uh, so these are all examples of how having digital authentication allows you online, allows you to create mobility, choice, convenience for people. And this is available for a billion people. 1.2 billion people can now do this, which is why it has a big impact. Now, along with that, Doing authentication, you can also do what's called as a KYC. And KYC in financial terminology is know your customer. And as you know today, whenever you want to buy a financial product or whenever you want to buy a mobile connection, you have to go through a KYC process. And it's very pa it's paperwork intensive and cumbersome. What we have done in the India's infrastructure 
is that if you use, use your Aadhaar number and if you give consent to the service provider, then the, UI, the Aadhaar system will give your name, your address, and your photograph to the service provider. And that is sufficient as a KYC to access the product. So the elect this is called as electronic KYC. And you can do this in two minutes. You just put your finger, authorize, and the KYC comes. And currently, India is doing 3 billion KYCs a year. 3 billion KYCs a year. Because this electronic KYC is common to opening a bank account, buying a mutual fund, getting an insurance policy, buying a pension, or buying a SIM card from your mobile operator. So India is the only country where there's a common electronic KYC across five different regulators, all of which allow you to buy products instantaneously. And this is why it's very, very popular among banks and, and uh, mobile companies. If you buy a, today if you buy a mobile connection, inevitably you have to do an Aadhaar KYC. Now, why is this important? First, it is a huge productivity benefit. Instead of spending weeks, you get a phone in two minutes. It's a convenience benefit. It's a cost benefit for the service provider. So if it was historically, if it was costing the service provider 500 rupees to get a bank account or a mutual fund, now it costs only 5 rupees to acquire the customer. And what that does is that it ex expands the market or expands the customers for all these services. And one of the reasons that you're seeing the financialization of the Indian markets, where increasingly in the last few years, more and more people are putting their money into the financial uh, sector by you know, putting them in bank accounts and deposits or buying mutual funds or, or buying uh, insurance is because it's becoming more and more convenient to buy these financial products. And so you're actually seeing a slow shift of Indian assets from real estate and gold into financial sector, which is the financialization that is happening. Just to give an example, the Indian capital markets have been heavily reliant on foreign investment. But last year, the amount of FDI, uh, FII, which is the foreign institutional investments into Indian markets, was about, I think, about $10 billion. And the amount of money from domestic investors was about twice that. So actually, because more and more Indian money, domestic money is coming into our financial markets, the balance of new money actually has shifted in favor of Indian money, which is a good thing for the economy, because it's not dependent on some foreign money going in and out, you know, whenever there's some crisis. And this is also enabled through what's called as systemic investment plans, SIPs, which is somebody who's a salaried professional, every month says, okay, I'll, I put 5,000 rupees from my salary into a mutual fund. That business alone in India is a billion dollars a month. And this is remarkably achieved in the last couple of years. So this KYC is very important to accelerate inclusion, to get people into systems. And again, one billion people can do the KYC. The third thing you can do with the same infrastructure is you can digitally sign a document. And you know, digital signature is very important because when you start doing large business transactions uh, electronically, you need a way to make sure the documents are secure, they're non-repudiable, they're encrypted, and so on. And you can now you do that with digital signatures. And so today, with your Aadhaar and your phone, you can digitally sign a document. So example, you apply for a loan on your phone, you can electronically sign it and send it in, in two minutes. And therefore, you can make the entire thing paperless. So digital signatures, again, is something uh, which is picking up. Already about 30, 40 million transactions have been done using digital signatures. And as more and more documents are submitted online, they will use these signatures, and therefore, you have a you have the infrastructure for a billion people to do digital signatures. And I'll just come back to what this means, but I'll talk about a couple of other things and then come back to the data part, because I know the next panel is about data. I thought I'd lead into that. The other big thing which we have done in India is built a very advanced peer-to-peer -peer payment system called UPI. And UPI stands for Unified Payment Interface, which is uh, essentially a uh, peer-to-peer instant debit to your bank account, instant credit to the other person's bank account at scale. And UPI has been launched by an entity called NPCI, or National Payment Corporation of India, which is a Section 25 non-profit company collectively owned by the banks. And they launched this about three years back. 
It was launched, in fact, when Raghu was the governor uh, who's coming tomorrow, and Raghu was very helpful in, in getting it done. Now, UPR was, it's a new system because it's, it uses, you can send money from your mobile phone, your app, to somebody else's mobile phone, somebody else's app. It doesn't need cards, it's all paperless, it's all there. But it was trudging along, and up to the month of October of 2016, UPI was doing 100,000 transactions a month. So October 2016, the month before demonetization, UPI was doing 100,000 transactions a month. In the month of February 2018, that 100,000 transactions has gone to 172 million transactions. So, they don't clap, yeah, clap for NPCI guys. So they have managed to take it to 172 million transactions. And my estimate is that at the rate of growth that you're seeing, this will go to a billion transactions by December of this year. And the reason for this is that it's very, very convenient to use. It's a real-time system. It does instant debit to your bank account, does instant credit, and it is an API or an application programming interface system which means that you can hook all kinds of uh, tools to that. For example, Google has Google Taze, which works on UPI. WhatsApp has come out with WhatsApp payments, which is based on UPI. Uh, PhonePay, which is a Flipkart company, is very successful at payments. Uh, Paytm is doing it. Reliance will come out soon with a bank. So suddenly you'll have, and then of course you have the existing banks and all. So suddenly you have all these eight or 10 companies and products all competing for payments. All of them will try to compete to acquire customers, but the backbone of that will be the UPI payment system. And next is that all the wallet guys, the MobiQuicks and all, will also come on to UPI, which is why the whole thing will take off dramatically. And for the first time, you'll have a payment system which is so easy to use that it'll start the migration of people from cash to cashless. So what demonetization was supposed to have done but obviously it set the ball rolling on these things, will actually happen now in the next two to three years as more and more people start doing payments with this. And these payments can be done, so even merchant payments, you go to a Kirana store, you point to a QR code and make a payment, all these kind of things will start happening. So I think the other big revolution which is happening is the fact that you have electronic payments, and in the next stage of this uh, UPI, which is called 2.0, which is getting launched in three, four months, it has the thing called electronic mandates. So you can programmatically set up instructions. You can say that whenever I travel by Uber or Ola, if the bill is less than 1,000 rupees, automatically debit it when I get out of the taxi. So you don't have to do anything, you just walk out and the money gets debited. Or you can set up an SIP saying, every time I get a, uh, you know, my salary, credit 5,000 rupees to my mutual fund at you know, DSP BlackRock or something. So, you can set up all these kind of instructions. So we see a massive leap in payments happening. So the, so the first revolution was the Aadhaar and Aadhaar related stuff. The second big revolution is what's happening with payments. And we'll see a massive increase in payments uh, in, the, in the coming years. The third big thing which is happening is what's happening to our indirect tax system. Uh, we are all aware that India has gone through this massive uh, shift of its indirect tax. Historically, indirect taxes in India were administered separately by the central government and the state governments. Central government does excise and service tax. State governments had what's called VAT, value-added tax, and every state had a different system for value-added tax. All this has now been put together into one simple system, a single system called GST, which is the goods and services tax. And you know this whole process, you know, and there's a lot of you know, debate about how many rates we should have, and so on. But the real important part of GSC, which we tend to ignore, is we have now taken a set of disparate technology systems and brought the entire country onto one single backbone called the GST network. The GST network is a real-time system with 10 million businesses registered on it, which means that every taxpayer in the country who pays indirect tax, it could be Reliance Industries or Hindustan Unilever at one end, it could be the neighborhood hairdressing saloon which pays service tax at the other end, they're all on the same system. And all of them are going to be uploading their invoices onto this system, which means 
billions of invoices are going to get uploaded onto the GSA system in the coming years. The reason why you need to upload invoices is that if you have to get credit for anything you buy, you need to have the invoice from your seller to take credit. And therefore, this creates an interlocking system of compliance, which will help in raising more revenues. But equally importantly, you will have real-time data on the invoices in the country. And what that does, it creates a new power of data. Because now, 10 million in businesses will have data of the business performance in a government audited system. And now that company can now offer that data to a bank or to an NBFC or any lender and say, look, here's my business performance. I, I did 50 lakhs of sales last month. This month I did 60 lakhs of sales. And this is a proof of that. Here are the invoices. And these invoices are certified by the GSC system. And that becomes the basis of credit. So what you're going to see in India is an uh, explosion of small business lending because historically, the problem for small business in India have been an inability to get access to credit because of knowledge asymmetry, because the lender had no way of assessing the credit viability of a small company. So they started giving it to big guys who all disappeared. You know what happened there, right? <laughs> so hopefully, this will be a new world of credit where the small guy is going to start getting credit. So you're going to democratize access to credit, and that credit will not be based on some guy looking at his face, but looking at actual data, looking at actual invoices, which are coming from a ratified system, and then deciding to give credit. And this is going to have a massive implication on the economy, because it means that you're going to democratize credit. And that's what, where the data comes in. So when you have data at that scale, then you suddenly create new things. And the same thing will happen with Aadhaar and EKYC and all that. Because now you can have, I can now create a digital trail. When I do electronic payments, I can do a digital trail of my electronic payments. When I, uh, you know, open a bank, when I pay a bill, in fact, another big system coming is the Bharat bill payment system, which is going to do all the bill processing. So all the bill records I can, I can share and say, this is my track record. And I can use that to get credit. So fundamentally, what is happening is that India is creating a data infrastructure where unlike in the, in the West, where the data is in the hands of a few guys, and you saw what happened when, when something went wrong, uh, you have a situation where every individual and every business can be empowered to have his own data. Because he can say, he can ask GST to ask for his business records, he can ask the bank to give his bank statement, he can ask the income tax system to give his tax directed at source. So suddenly data is going to be empowering. And this whole thing is part of what's called as a data empowerment architecture, which, and India will be probably the first country in the world to have a data empowerment architecture at scale of one billion people. And it's very different from what's happening anywhere in the world. And it's very important because you have to realize that why India is different from the West is that in the West, d uh, people were economically rich before they were data rich, right? If you think of the internet revolution in the last 15 years, US per capita incomes at $40,000. So in those kind of situations, the business models that emerge was those that used the data to sell things to you, ads and so on. That's what you saw happening in the West. India is very different because India is going to be data rich or Indians and Indian businesses are going to be data rich before they're economically rich, right? Because you're going to have per capita income of $1,500, $2,000, but the digital footprint of individuals and the digital footprints of businesses will be on par with anything in the West because they'll have the same tools. In some cases, better tools. So, what happens, therefore, if you're data rich as an individual before you're economically rich, and if you are a small business who's data rich but doesn't have access to capital, you can now take your own data and in some sense monetize it for yourself, not for somebody else, to get access to credit or to get access to better healthcare or to get access to better skills. So the fundamental model in which business models will emerge in India with data are going to be those that empower individuals and businesses to use the plentiful data that they're going to generate for their own 
future, for advancing their lives, for getting better loans, better credit, better health care, better education, better skills, better jobs, better livelihoods. And this is the fundamental shift which is going to happen uh, in India thanks to all the infrastructure. So I think what we are seeing, therefore, I'll come to an end now, is we have a situation where over a decade, India has built some very advanced digital infrastructure at population scale, all layered, all open, so, uh, all using open source, so it's very cheap, all, use, you know, all real time. And now all these things are bringing about what you can call as combinatorial innovation. They're combining with each other to create new innovative products and services. So what you're going to see now is people will look at all these different layers and say, how can I combine these things to create something new? And so you're going to see a burst of innovation, which is combinational innovation, which combines these things. And you're going to see lots of products and services, which I think is going to have a big impact on the lives of everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. It is said that in the world of uh, digitalization, digital identity is the only identity. And I want to take this opportunity to really thank leaders like you who've been able to help India create a digital footprint in its true sense. So a huge round of applause for Mr. Nandan Ilikini. Thank you. We'll take a few questions for him. Please uh, give me a show of hands so we can send the mic in your direction. Uh, that was an excellent uh, talk. This is Dr. George here. Uh, you talked about combinational use of data and technology. I mean, you have Indians, India, able to take money, uh, take whatever is to be given, deposited elsewhere. How come in this democracy we have no recycling or no pickup of garbage, including yeah. Bangalore or Kerala? Yeah. Well, Why I'd can we not the... have this be picked up? We yeah. are having even recycling of politicians. They keep coming back even when we throw them out. But the garbage, <laughs> it doesn't disappear. Can you give us a solution, please? Yeah, well, actually, it's a very good uh, thing. I, I, I look at more digital stuff than physical stuff, unfortunately. So <laughs> I've, been, I've been not looking at this garbage thing. But I agree with you. I think we need to recycle garbage. And it's going to be a big mess. Uh, I, I'm completely with you on that, except that I'm not thinking about it. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Next question, please. Hello, uh, this is Sandeep from Atto Innovations. Uh, just want to know, when you started off with Aadhaar as well as UPA, how did you get the government machinery and all the agencies to work in the startup mode and create a world-class product? Well, uh, in the case of Aadhaar, uh, you know, I was employee number one of this organization. So we were able to create it like a startup. One of my colleagues, Thomas Korath, is here, who was with me in... Uh, uh, in UIDI. So we started with a small lean team. Uh, we, we had people from government and from the private sector all working together. We had very sharp, very tight goals, very ambitious goals. So it was run in a very, very different way. Uh, and uh, in the case of UPI, see UPI is actually built by NPCI, the National Payment Corporation, where I'm an advisor. That is also another startup because NPCI is barely 10 years old, started in 2008-9. And there again, though it's a non-profit company owned by banks, it's run in a very entrepreneurial manner. And they are very, very open to technology and change. So very fortunate that we had organizations in the system that had the ability to think uh, entrepreneurially and innovatively. Well said. Thank you, sir. Next question here in the front. Can I, in the meantime, can I ask? Um, I just have one question. With all this data being generated, who owns the data? Is it the customer? Is it the government? Do I have the right to ask the government to give me all the data you have about me? Do uh, I have the right to say, no, I don't want my data on your system? Well, there are two different questions you're asking. First is, do you, yes, your data, sh you should uh, be able to get your own data back, and in fact, this data empowerment architecture, which I mentioned, is actually an infrastructure which allows you to ask for your own data back. So for example, when a bank puts those APIs onto the banking system, then you can say, give me my last six months balances or last eight month transactions and so on. However, 
everyone has to do it. It's, I mean, the technical infrastructure is now in place in India to everyone to get their own data back, but each, each department has to implement. Now, this will happen in three ways. One is it will happen uh, because of uh, government agencies doing it themselves, or we have to, you know, convince them to do it. So income tax will put out your TDS details when you ask for it, or GST will give your invoice details if you ask for it. That's the government side. The second uh, pillar is going to be the regulated entities. So the Reserve Bank will ask the banks to do it. The uh, IRDA will ask the insurance company. But third is going to be companies or private guys. For that, you need a law. And right now, as you know, there's a committee under Justice Sri Krishna uh, for the data protection law. They had a draft paper which came out three months back, and their final law should come out in the next, uh, next few months. And hopefully, if that's brought and passed, that will then have the principles by which you can ask for your data from anybody. So that piece of the puzzle is yet to be finished. Great. Thank you, sir. One last question, please. Uh, Sunny Joseph here. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Nilkandi. Um, two, two questions, but before that, I want to congratulate you. As, I mean, it's appropriate that you are here to uh, spare the digital move for India as no, one of I'm, the founders. Uh, no, 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 no. It, uh, don't be so humble. I'm sure you are, because you are one of the founders of Infosys, and it's appropriate that you are here. And uh, my questions are: number one, uh, what sort of uh, opportunities does it throw for the throw? Up, I mean, this digital era in India does it throw up for the IT professionals who are the young graduates who are coming out, number one. Number two, if there is such a big potential, is there any scope for actually changing the H1B regime? Let, why do we run after H1B? We can build our own uh, center, our own Silicon Valley here in Kerala, and let them run after us and pay for us. India or Kerala? You're saying Kerala. I'm talking about yeah. Kerala. Yeah. Kerala is, in, uh, <laughs> that's what I mean. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, obviously, you know, we are going to see a lot of innovation and uh, this combinatorial stuff in the next year. So that will create opportunities. It will need entrepreneurs, of course. But yeah, I think, um, you know, if India will, can be a big market for these innovations. And in many of the innovations will actually be taken globally from India. You know, I'll give you a good example. The payments innovation happening is way ahead of anything else. And the many, many young Indian companies that have built devices and platforms around these payments. And now they are exporting that to other countries. So yes, once you become a, a leader on a particular technology track, not only create domestic uh, uh, demand, you also create global things. So that's very much going to happen. Whether that will you know, replace the H1 kind of thing, I, I know, that I don't know. And whether it will happen in Kerala also, you know, I'm, may happen here also, I'm, I, I, I don't know. But, but I think we now have to, the good news is that we will have a uh, massive expansion of domestic technological innovation. And that's going to create jobs and ideas and companies and wealth and all that. Thank you so much. Uh, please allow us to extend our gratitude to you. May I request uh, Mr. Shibulal to please come on stage, the chairman of HPIC, Government of Kerala. Please welcome him on stage to honor Mr. Nanda Nilekum. Thank you. Thank you.